How badly do I need to get zapped to trip one of these or one of these? But I'm not an electro boom, so I'll try to do this without a shower of sparks or electrocuting myself. So I've got a GFCI breaker and some sockets here. And what these do is to make sure that all the current that comes out of the hot terminal returns through neutral. Because if there's any imbalance, that might be current that is going through somebody's body and zapping them. So when that happens, it shuts off the power. So right now I've got this GFCI socket connected to a power cord. And that's like it's wired into the house. And off of that, I'm running this light. And I've also got this power cord here. And it just ends right here and a grounded glass of water. And now if I just take this and I dip the hot terminal just slightly into the water, that immediately trips the uh, GFCI fault because there's a tiny bit of current that went through the water that was out of balance. And it can detect this tiny imbalance even with a 10 amp load hooked up like this heat gun. This time I'll use this AC power supply plus Variac to precisely control how much voltage I've got going through this resistor to just pass a few milliamps unbalanced into neutral before it trips and I'll measure the current with this meter. 2.1 milliamperes, 3 milliamperes, 3.7, 4.3, 4.6, 4.9, and it tripped. And now with a 10 amp load, 3.6 milliamps, 4.4, 4 4.7, 4 4 5, and it tripped. Now I've got two pads hooked up to the same power supply in Variac with this to measure the current, and I've got it set so that even if I turn the voltage up to maximum in this Variac, the voltage between the two pads only goes up to 46 volts which is considered safe by OSHA standards, so you don't need any insulation for that kind of voltage. So the next part of this video was going to be exploring what 5 milliamps feels like, but that got the video age restricted. I guess I can't blame YouTube for being cautious that way. So instead of all my oohs and ahs and cranking up the current, I'll just tell you my results instead. So with the juice just going through two fingers, my threshold of detection was 0.23 milliamps. Below that, I couldn't even tell that it was there, but cranking up further by 0.37 it got irritating and by 0.73 I actually found it intolerable and pulled my hand off. So nowhere near 5 milliamps. Now too much juice going through the muscles causes them to clamp up which can make it impossible to let go, but I only had it going through my fingers without contact anywhere else on me. It couldn't really go anywhere else and the muscles that control the hand are actually in the forearm, so no risk there. And it didn't even get up to a milliamp here, but uh, let's just try the whole palm of the hand. And I could tolerate much more that way, with my threshold detection ending up as high as 2.6 milliamps. And by 3.8 it got irritating, but at the voltage range I was using, I couldn't get enough juice flowing, so I ended up applying some water and trying again. And with that, the threshold detection went up to 4.5. Now I can feel a tingle. And by 5.2 it got annoying. It's annoying, but not painful. And by 7 I found it intolerable and let go. And both times, as soon as I lifted my hand, the stimulus was gone, there was no after effects. Not like hitting your funny bone, where it hurts for quite a while afterwards. And so I never exceeded 10 milliamps, which below that is considered fairly safe. And I also never exceeded 50 volts on the pads, and 50 volts or below is also generally considered safe, no insulation required, even though <laughs> I found it actually quite intolerable. But I think as long as you're not making deliberate wet contact, 50 volts probably is no big deal. It's just if you're really trying to get good flow, then it becomes irritating. But having established that I could do over 5 milliamperes, that's enough for a GFCI, so <laughs> the next experiment was setting off the GFCI by hand. Now I've got the current that's going to go through here, also go through the neutral of the GFI, so I think I can reset it like that. Yep. But that's kind of cheating because I'm using a separate current source to trip it, uh, not using line voltage. So now I've got this plugged straight into AC and I measure 120 volts across here. So my next experiment was with one pad on hot and the other one on ground. And I had a 10k ohm resistor in series to really limit the current to safe levels. 
but still let enough through to set off the GFCI and then it's just I slammed down on it. Didn't actually, I didn't feel it, uh, it tripped so fast, I didn't feel it go at all. And now I took out my safety resistor, so I'm really counting on that GFI to trip, otherwise it'll be very painful. But uh, here goes. Once again, it tripped immediately, and so there was no sensation of any tingling or anything like that. Probably just my slapping down my hand just overrode everything. Now, had that GFCI failed, I'm sure that would have hurt quite a bit. But the way I had it set up, the juice couldn't really flow anywhere other than my hand, so um, I'm, I'm sure it would have been painful, but I don't think it would have caused any injury. And I actually do know how much that would hurt, because back in the 80s, we were building a house, and my dad wasn't happy where an electrician had put a socket, so he'd ask me to move it, so I undid the screws, and I pulled it out and grabbed that socket by the screws, and then I realized there's something very important I neglected to do. It hurt like hitting the funny bone, and it hurt, I don't know, for a few seconds afterwards, but it was the 80s, you know. A lot of things that are dangerous now weren't dangerous back then. Now with my experiments going up to, say, 50 volts, I got nowhere near to 100 milliamps where it could possibly be fatal. But I plotted the uh, voltage versus current for a previous experiment, and an interesting thing happens here between 35 and 40 volts. The slope goes up dramatically. So just because at 40 volts I might only get 6 milliamps doesn't mean it only triples by the time I get to 120 volts because that slope is not consistent. But uh, I was curious how much further that would go here, but uh, <laughs> it was too intolerable. I didn't care to go there. So I've popped one of these apart to see how it works. Uh, this one here, actually. And inside we have the circuitry for it down here. And these are the contacts that can turn the power on and off. And the hot and neutral go through this thing here, which is a little transformer. And basically, as long as hot and neutral have exactly the same amount of current, they cancel each other in that transformer and it outputs nothing. But if there's just a slight imbalance, there's enough for the circuitry to detect here, and then that activates this solenoid, which pushes on here a little bit like that. And that unlatches this button, which is normally in here. I just gotta latch it into somehow. There. And normally the spring here pulls up on here and that holds the contacts closed. And when that solenoid activates, it uh, pushes against here. Like that. <laughs> Let's go with the button and that no longer pulls up on these contacts and it opens the circuit.